the, um, the hairlines are not going to be super fine. You know, we always strive as a calligrapher to have just hairline, hairlines that look like a... What's up everybody, Milenis here and welcome to the Calligraphy Masters podcast. This is a show where I talk with some of the most inspiring and influential artists in the world of calligraphy, lettering and sign painting with the goal of exploring their mindset and understand how they became successful. In today's episode, I'm very excited to finally speak with my teammate Susan Cunningham, who is a huge inspiration to me and all people who love copper plate script. We talk about her journey in calligraphy, her struggles on the way of learning calligraphy, about playing tennis and her daughters, about social media, client work and much more. So let's jump into it. So hi Susie, it's, it's, it's good to see you finally. Like Hello, I know it's so great to see you and actually talk with you. Yeah, it's, 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 it's cool because like uh, we've been only talking like via messages and uh, never seen your face and like had to I talk know. with you. I know, so this is great, I love it. Yeah, I love it. I, like, I wish it was like life. It would be even more better, but <laughs> it's still a start. Maybe one of these days I'll get over to where you are. Yeah, sure. Like, you should come to Europe. Like, there are so many people who will be hyped about you being here. Like, it'd be awesome. I would love that. The, the thing about me is that I am such a bad airplane traveler. I am a chicken. It's terrible. And uh, so if I have some family there with me to, like, get me through the plane ride, I would do it in a heartbeat. But um, I don't know. Just by myself, I'm pretty chicken. <laughs> well, I don't know. Like, I love traveling with airplanes, but they're different people, of course. Yeah, I know it. So that means that you need to come to the U.S. to see us. <laughs> well, that's, I don't know. I think it's, it's. For me, it's much more difficult, I guess, or I think so. I'm not sure. Like, I don't know what's the procedure of going from U.S. to Europe, but if you're in Europe and have to go to U.S., you have to have this green card and, I don't know, all kinds of uh, permissions, which is not, like, that easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely more difficult, for sure. But anyway, I don't know. Hopefully one day one of us will make it to the other side. I, you know? I know. I know. I would love to meet you in person. And all, all, of, all of your friends over there that are so cool and so talented. I would love to meet each of you. Well, we all would love to meet you as well. Like We love uh, your skills and everything that you do. So oh, it, it's thank likewise. You. Thank so, you, thank you. So, Susie, can you tell me a little bit about you? Like, you've been, you have quite a lot of experience with calligraphy, but can you tell me, like, uh, where from, how old are you, and uh, how, when and how did you discover your love for letters? Sure, sure. Well, I live in North Alabama, which is in the southern part of the United States. It's one of the southern states, and um, I'm 51. I just had a birthday. So, um, thank you. It was in February, late February. So, I'm 51, and I have been doing calligraphy as far as my background goes. I, I, I tried to start doing calligraphy as a child, a young child. I would copy beautiful letters anytime I could. My mom had one of the Speedball Book of Alphabets, and I would sit and just try to copy those letters as best I could. And whatever happened to be on TV at the moment, that's what I would write down. So I've got notebooks filled with commercial slogans and, and whatever I was listening to at the moment, I would write those phrases down and everything. So I've been loving beautiful letters as long as I can ever remember. And then in 93... I lived um, a couple of hours away from where I do right now, but um, my boyfriend at the time, he's my husband now, but he told me that um, he said, you should, Mylon, did I lose you? Okay, okay, something just weird just happened to my computer, and I almost think my computer has a virus. Um, so I cannot see you anymore, but as long, can you still see me? Okay. Okay, great. Okay, great. Continuing on then. I can't see you, but I can hear you completely fine. Um, 
so anyway, in 93, um, my boyfriend at the time said, you need to go um, take some samples to some wedding shops and to some stationery stores. So I did, and I had a lady that was so very kind to me um, at this, this one little wedding shop, and um, she put my work in her book of calligraphers. So if you ordered your invitation from her, you got to look through her book and choose a calligrapher. So she would recommend me from time to time. And that's how I got most of my work in the very beginning. Um, you know, there was no social media, there were no websites, nothing of the sort. So I feel like she was a very important part to the beginning of my professional career because every time I would get an order from her, say if the order was for 300 envelopes, then that would be 300 people that would see my work. And so it was mainly word of mouth. And, um, you know, like a lot of the mothers of the brides, they would keep the envelopes and say, oh, I've kept all of the envelopes for the last two years and yours is the one that we wanted for my daughter's wedding and so on and so forth. So, um, so that's how I got my start really in addressing the wedding envelopes. And, um, I charged a whole 50 cents for an outer and an inner together. And I can remember I had a friend that said, Suzanne, you've got to go up to a dollar. You, you know, you're too cheap. And I said, it's a dollar. Who's going to pay one whole dollar for me to address a wedding invitation? So it, when I did finally go up to a dollar, he was so happy for me. He said, you need to go up to two dollars now. But um, I, so I can safely say I've blown the one dollar out of the, the ballpark. So he would be proud of me for sure. But so anyway, and so then the rest is history, I guess. And then when um, Instagram came about, uh, that, that was a total game changer. That, you know, put my, my work in front of a lot more people. And, and so I, I do get a lot of orders from Instagram and, and social media. So it's great. But how is it like uh, that a lady like you and your age is like, how did you come into Instagram? Like, I know. For example, I know you have like two daughters. Is that correct? They're not here, yes. right? Yes, yes, they're not. They're not here right now. I've got a 21-year-old that's in college, and I've got a 15-year-old that's that spent the night with someone. But, but yes, I have two daughters, and I guess they got me into Instagram. And really, if I had known in the beginning that I would gather up a few followers, I probably should have made a separate account for calligraphy and then a personal one. Um, but this is just my personal account. Like, if you scroll back to the very beginning of my feed, it's just, you know, family pictures. And then it sort of morphed into calligraphy. And now it's uh, that's the only thing I post on there. Um, so, definitely, they got me in, into Instagram. You know for sure that I cannot do technology. It's one of the reasons I don't um, have a website. I don't even know if I could operate it once someone built it for me. So, and I also feel like, well, I've lasted 26 years without a website, so it's not completely necessary. I know it would be super handy, though, for those who like to sign up for workshops and things of that nature. I do get it. And that is a goal for me for this summer, so we'll see if I follow through with that, but I don't know. I did, Technology and I do not mix. I can assure you of that. It's not my friend. And, um, but definitely my daughters got me into the Instagram. They said, mom, you need to get with it and, you know, get with the program and stay in the, in the current times. <laughs> but how do you feel and how do they feel like you being your age and your Instagram being like, uh, so going so well and they, that, that they're like young and they don't have such audiences like you. I know. I know. Well, I, you know, they don't care. Actually, my younger daughter, she's not into social media that much. Um, she doesn't even have a Facebook. And I've asked her several times, you not want to get a Facebook? She does not. So, which I'm really glad for that fact. Um, so, it doesn't bother her in the least. Um, that's my 15-year-old. My 21-year-old actually has quite a following herself. Um, so, she, her personal account is, is larger for a personal account. And then she's got a, um, a makeup account as well that she likes to 
do her makeup uh, posts with on that. So she they've they've got enough to keep them busy without having to worry about me. <laughs> but is it like is it your skills only like developed but by yourself? Did you learn everything on your own on or there was a point in your life where you were using some books or you attended some workshops, some professional guidance or something like yes. this? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I was self-taught for years on end and I'll tell you a, a, a funny story. For the longest time, I did not even use a a, a dip pen and ink. I used a Pilot Precise V7, which is just a rollerball pen. Hmm. And so I didn't even really do true calligraphy for a long time. Um, what I would do when I addressed the wedding envelopes, I sat on my couch, which is very comfortable, by the way, but I don't recommend that now with a dip pen. But I sat on my couch, I had a leather binder that I would sit in my lap and when I would press down on the envelopes, because that leather had a little bit of give in it, that was actually acting as a leather blotter, and I didn't even realize it. So I could get a little bit of a shade and a little bit of a hairline. Now, nothing like you can get now with a pointed pen, but I would get just enough of a, of a difference in the shades and the hairlines that it, it kept me away from the pointed pen. I was scared to death of it. I didn't know how to operate it. It looked foreign to me. Um, so I did that for years, but I knew my letter forms. I had uh, the book Mastering Copper Plate Calligraphy by Eleanor Winters, which is phenomenal, by the way. So I studied that a lot to get my letter forms down. And then when I was on Instagram, I don't know, five or six years ago, I realized that the reason I could not get my nib to cooperate with me was that I wasn't prepping the nib. Mm -hmm. My brand new nibs, I had no idea that you had to get that clear coating off. Yeah. Um, and so I noticed in the comments, someone was asking about that and explaining it. And it was like the hallelujah angels started singing mm -hmm. when I cleaned my first nib and realized that the ink would stick to it and I could make it work. So I, um, that was a true game changer for me. And um, yeah, so the rest is history with that. But, um, but so then I start, I joined Iampeth. I started going to um, the, the Iampeth conferences and started taking formal lessons then. But I feel like I was a little bit of ahead of the game, actually probably way ahead of the game because I already knew my letter forms. So I wasn't trying to learn the letter forms and uh, learn to manipulate the tines and the pen at the same time. I was strictly learning how to operate the pen because I already knew what the letters were supposed to look like. So I do feel like I was way ahead of the game once I started using the pointed pen. Um, but yes, I, so I started with the, the Mastering Copper Plate Calligraphy book. And then once I joined Iampeth, I just, you know, read everything I could. I went to as many lessons as I could and um, learned as many different types of calligraphy scripts as I could, but I do feel like my forte is going to be copper plate. I know how to do Spencerian. Um, mine sort of looks like a first graders. <laughs> it's not the best in the world. I'm sure it would be better if I practiced, but I don't practice like I should, which is, I mean, I, I rarely practice Spencerian. Um, I, I don't know, I'm just so busy doing wedding orders and commissions and things of that nature that I feel like I don't have time or I don't make time for it. And most of the time when people ask me to do something, it is in copper plate. So I don't know, that just seems to monopolize most of my time these days. I see. And uh, how much how much time were you spending on practice when you were like uh, learning with the proper rules and proper guidance? Like how much was important for you practicing? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't know if I can put an amount on it per se. I think it was on and off pretty much all the time. 
uh, early in the mornings before I would get busy with with my other job. And then at night, I would sit down. Well, at night, I would sit down even before I used the pointed pen. I would sit down and address envelopes all night long. <clears throat> and then when I did learn how to use the pointed pen, it would be a combination of practicing and then addressing the envelopes. So I was still reinforcing my letter forms, even if I wasn't using the pointed pen. Um, even if I was using that Pilot Precise pen, I, I was still keeping the letter forms fresh in my mind and fresh in my hand. I was maintaining the muscle memory. Um, but once I switched over completely to the pointed pen, which was maybe five or six years ago, um, I honestly practice on and off all day. It's not solid, you know, by any means, but it's 30 minutes here or there, any time that I can squeeze in between life getting in the way or a project, things of that nature. But I just always try to not sit down so much and just doodle and just, you know, pass the time away. Like I really want to have a goal in point for that little practice session, even if it's 10 or 15 minutes. If I'm struggling with making um, a, a large horizontal oval entry loop, I'm going to sit down for 10 or 15 minutes and do nothing but those and fill up two or three pages um, and, and I do think this is very wise to do, and I see a lot of other people practicing that way too. Um, I just I would always try to have something that I was working on that um, would fill up my practice time and not just sit there and just, you know, write whatever. I would really try to have a goal in mind, and I think that's so very important. I see. Do you remember what was the biggest struggle you had when you were still learning and how did you overcome it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, one thing that I seem to struggle with, it, it is definitely better, but especially in the beginning, I would struggle with squaring off flat tops and flat bottoms. And I think part of that was just because I hadn't had enough practice doing it yet which for me, it's sort of tricky. Um, some people can just do that very well naturally. That's not a forte of mine. So I have to really concentrate when I'm trying to do that. And um, I think part of my problem, honestly, was the nib that I was using. Um, I used a Nico G for a long time, and I will still use it occasionally, and I do love that nib. I know it's always thought of as a beginner nib, I don't really agree with that. I think it's a great nib for a lot of, of things. And if I ever have to do reproduction work, say if I have to write a, um, a wedding invitation and they're going to make a plate of it to be engraved, I will probably use a Nico G. But for whatever reason, I cannot get square tops and square bottoms as well with that particular nib. And that was the only nib that I was using in the beginning. So I thought it was just me. I thought I was doing something wrong and I would practice over and over and over. And sometimes I would do them great, but more often than not, I would not like them. And so now I use usually either a Hunt 101 or a Hunt 22. And I can definitely get square tops and square bottoms better with that nib than I can the Nico G. Um, and that's not to say it's the nib, it's just me. It is operator error, I'm sure. I'm sure there are many people out there that can, can do that with ease with the Nico G. So don't, I'm not dissing it, and I do love that nib. But um, for whatever reason, it does not work great with me squaring off the tops and bottoms. And the other stroke that I always sort of seem to struggle with is a descending loop. Don't ask me why, it's just not my friend. The, the ascending loop, I can do fine, but the descending loop sort of gives me trouble sometimes. So those are definitely t a couple of the areas that I am constantly very aware of whenever I, I come to that sh particular stroke. I'm super aware. I don't let my mind wander. I, um, I'm really paying attention to what I'm doing because they don't come naturally to me for some reason. I don't know why. Wish they did. <laughs> 
Well, I have no experience with the pointed nips. I have some holders and some nips, but they just, mm -hmm. they sit there brand new and I'm afraid <laughs> to touch them. So can you, can you speak a, li a little bit about nips and uh, what's the difference between like some of the most uh, known nips? Like what is one nips can be used that <laughs> other cannot be used for? And what's the difference mm -hmm. between all brands that are so popular amongst calligraphers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I do feel like the Nico G is very good if you're doing reproduction work. The, um, the hairlines are not going to be super fine. You know, we always strive as a calligrapher to have just hairline, hairlines that look like a, a tiny spider web. And we want them to be so fine and thin and delicate. But that's not going to show up when you, when you um, even if it's just a photocopy or if you're trying to um, scan something, it's not really gonna show up well in the scan, not well enough to be um, reproduced or like an engraved plate made out of it. So definitely the nibs that don't give you those super fine hairlines are better for reproduction work, like a Nico G, a Zebra G. Um, that one, the hairline will be a little bit finer than the Nico G. Um, and then the more the more flexible nibs like the um, the Hunt 22, the Hunt 101, the Gelat 303, um, those are going the tines are going to spread open further when you press down on those. So you're going to get a really wider swell, which is beautiful, and you're going to get a finer hairline because it's sharper on the end. But now the downside of that is that you have to have a lighter hand because if you press down too hard on the paper when you're making an upstroke, it's going to catch in your paper. And that's not good. Uh, you're going to, you know, splatter ink everywhere and it's going to catch and you're gonna have a rough spot in your hairline. That's not pretty. So you really have to um, glide your nib across the paper. And I'll tell you the one nib, or actually a couple of nibs that I have found that work really well, I think, and I think I've, I've shared this before on Instagram, but my favorite nibs with metallic ink are the Gelat 404 and a Blanzy 605. I use the 404 most often because um, it, it's readily available. I can order it, you know, anytime. It's very inexpensive. So I always try to keep several of those on hand. The Blanzy 605 is also very, very great for metallic ink, but that is going to be a vintage nib, so it's a little bit trickier to find. And it's gonna cost more, but it does work great. And I, I do definitely use that sometimes um, with the metallic inks. And I also use the 404 anytime I'm writing on handmade paper. Now, with the, with the 404, you're not going to get a super, super fine hairline. I don't think it's quite as pointed as the Gelat 303. But um, with that metallic ink, it's got little tiny particles. It's made of mica. And those particles are harder to come out of the more pointed nibs I have found anyway. Maybe it's just me. But um, the 404 is not quite as pointed, and I don't know. The ink just flows out of it much better, um, in my experience, anyway. For how long do you approximately use one nip, and uh, do they break, or what, at what point do you decide <laughs> that you cannot use this nip anymore and you have to mm -hmm. get another one? Uh huh. Well, honestly, it depends on how much I'm using it. Like if I'm using the Hunt 101, I, that's the one that I'm currently using right now on the, the wedding order that I'm working on. Um, it is super sharp. It's going to wear out a little faster for me than the 404 wheel, which is not quite as sharp. Um, and so I'm using it all day long, all night long, off and on addressing these invitations or addressing these envelopes. And so I'm putting a lot of wear and tear on it. And I can probably get maybe 50 to 75 envelopes out of that one nib. And I probably could get more, but I just know after about 50 or certainly after about 75, my nib feels really scratchy on the upstrokes. It doesn't feel, 
you know, good to me on the paper. And I noticed too that I've got to have a super, super light touch to the paper. Otherwise, it's going to catch every time. And so I really know at that point that if it starts catching on my upstrokes, that I need to change out my nib. And a lot of times, you don't really realize you need to change out your nib until you do. And then the new one feels so much better than the old one. You're like, why did I not change this out two days ago? This feels so much better to me. Um, so it really just is a, a matter of how much you're using it. If I'm not in the middle of an order that I'm working on, and I'm just practicing here and there throughout the day, um, you know, my, my nib might last a week or so. Um, also, it depends, I think, on the surface that you're working on. Like if I'm practicing on Rhodia paper or on Borden and Riley cotton comp, which is my very favorite paper to work on, it's going to last a lot longer than I'm, if I'm writing on a really, really nice wedding envelope. The nicer the envelope I have found, um, the, the more texture it has which is great. It's beautiful to look at. Um, and it's not going to be so much texture that you can't write on it and, it and it trips you up. It's not that much texture, texture, but it is enough. I have found anyway that it will eat the, nib, the point of your nib a lot quicker than say just a cheap envelope that's smoother. So um, I do love those textured envelopes though, but I, I go through the nibs a whole lot faster. So definitely it depends on what nib you're using and what surface you're riding on and how long your nib can last. Do you, do you have a favorite paper for like copper plate? Like what's the best paper in your opinion to do copper plate? If I'm going to sit down and practice, I prefer the Borden and Riley cotton comp. Um, it is, I, I feel like a little smoother than Rhodia even. And I do love Rhodia, and I still use Rhodia. I love it very, very much. It's smooth as silk. Uh, but the something about the cotton comp is even a little bit smoother to me. And it's very thin, so I can um, put my guidelines underneath it and see it without a light pad. So I like that. And um, I don't know, just the my my pen glides across it so well, and it just feels like, you know, slick as glass when I'm trying to ride on it. I really, really like it a lot. How much time do you usually spend on uh, creating one uh, envelope? And uh, a question that some people have asked on your videos that I've done on uh, YouTube for the envelopes. People ask, mm -hmm. is it even allowed to send such letters? Because I don't know, like the world we live, like some people think that uh, if it's handwritten, the post or somebody will not uh, accept it because they cannot read it or something like this. Right, right. And that is so true. That is very true. Um, it, as far on the first part of your question, as far as how long it takes me on each envelope, um, usually anywhere from, and this is a broad range, but usually anywhere from about 8 to 12 minutes for one envelope. And that's a double set. That's the outer and the inner together. I write very, very slowly. I know a lot of people can do it faster than that, and I wish I could. Um, I just feel like people are paying me to write beautifully and write very neat and as, as pretty as I can make it. And so if I rush through it and do it faster than that, then it's messy and it's sloppy and it doesn't look good. My ovals are not, you know nice and, and shaped the way, the way they're supposed to be, it, it's not a pretty look for me. And I feel like that's more important when I turn that order back into the bride. I want it to be absolutely as perfect as I can get it. I usually try to write the envelopes just as though I were writing an envelope that I'm going to give someone as a sample for them to decide if they're going to use me or not. Those envelopes I try to make super perfect. Well, I try to make my wedding envelopes just as perfect. So I go really slowly. Um, so it also depends too on how long the address is. You know, if you've got an address that is Dr. and Mrs. Sally Jane Smith and Mr. 
John David Smith. So that's two lines instead of one line. And then they have their address and then say they live in an apartment. That's going to go on a separate line. So that one takes, that's, that's like the 12 minute ones. Those are a lot longer. So if the, if the list has um, a lot of cases where the woman is the doctor, that's going to separate those two lines. So that's an extra line or live in an apartment. That's an extra line. Or if they have the first, middle, and last name of each person, that takes an extra amount of time. So it really depends on the um, how in-depth the list is, really. And I forgot the second part of your question now. <laughs> About the post offices? and Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, so what I like to try to do is on the zip code, since a machine is reading those numbers, I don't make them fancy at all. I don't do no flourishes hardly at all on the numbers in the zip code. I make them very plain, very legible. Knock on wood, and I hope I'm not just jinxing myself. I've never had any trouble in 26 years of um, the post office reading any of my work. And I really do try to make it not overly, overly flourished. I try to make you know, one or two little flourishes here and there on each line. And by the time you get three lines of just a few flourishes, it looks way more flourished than what it actually is. Because you've got three or four lines, just one, two, three, four, right there together. And those few little flourishes go a long way, so it looks more flourished than it actually is. So I think it, at a glance, it looks way more detailed and once you actually start reading it, it's not quite as super fancy as what it looks like it is at first glance. But definitely on the zip code, I, I make those as plain as I can get them, for sure. I see. And, uh, like, other than envelopes and uh, invitations, are there any other kinds of uh, clients and jobs that you get to do? And what are they, if you mm -hmm. do? Yes, usually, the, probably 90% of my work is invitations of some sort, whether it's a wedding invitation or a rehearsal dinner or some kind of party of some sort. That's what I do the most. Occasionally, I will get um, someone that needs stationery made and they just need their name written. Or um, if I need to write um, the wedding vows, of the couple. I do that occasionally. Or if it's just like a commission piece, like someone is giving a baby gift and they need one. I do a cross that incorporates um, the baby's name and, and birth date and weight and height and all that kind of stuff. And there's a Bible verse incorporated there. So I call those my baby crosses. Um, so sometimes I'll do those. Mainly, though, it is going to be an envelope for some sort of function that someone is, is giving and needs it for. What are, what are the inks that you're using for uh, those kinds of jobs? And is it like a choice by the client or is it your own choice what uh, colors and inks to use? Um, yeah, it is all the choice of the client, for sure. A lot of the... Um, the wedding invitations that I work on will be in black, of course, obviously. That's, you know, always a classic. The one I'm working on right now is in silver, and it's so fun. I do silver some. I do gold quite a bit. That's really popular for weddings. And I will get the occasional navy or brown um, just to sort of be classic still, but with a little bit of a twist. People will go with either the navy or the brown, and that's fun, too. But it is 100% um, dictated by the client because they want, usually by the time they come to me, they already have an idea of what their invitation is going to look like. Sometimes they've already picked it out. And so they want my writing and my ink color to match what the invitation looks like. So the one that I'm doing right now is, um, I can't wait to share it. It's a, an invitation suite that I wrote the whole thing for, and it's in a light blue and silver. And so I'm addressing all of the envelopes in silver. So it's been really fun to work on.
Yes, but that's all dictated by the client, 100%. Unless they ask my opinion, and then I'll tell them what I think, you know, needs to be done. But, but definitely, mostly by them. And approximately how many envelopes do you have to do at a time? And what's been the biggest uh, order you had at once to do? Most of the time, I am going to do an order that is anywhere between 150 and maybe 250 or 300. Three, uh, over 300 is probably getting into your bigger weddings. Um, the one that I'm working on right now has about 250, 230 to 250, which is the perfect size because you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, not too far away. The huge orders are, are great to work on, but they are they last so long. And you might have 200 names that begin with a, an M. That's a really popular popular letter. And um, I don't know, those just take so long. I almost had rather have three smaller orders than one huge large order. The largest order that I've ever done was years and years ago. Um, I did one that was 1,300 envelopes. And I also had done one that was 1,100. Yeah. And I, I just, the 1,300 one, I just wanted to go, do you really know that many people? Now, that's invitation. So, we're talking like 2,600 people. And um, But come to find out, they owned several car dealerships in a very large city. So, I feel like maybe they did know that many people. And probably, I feel like they felt like they needed to invite those people um, so I don't know, but they were a joy to work with. I, I talked with the mother of the bride and she was precious and, um, but yeah, that is a lot of people. And then the one that was 1100 was when I first started and she wanted me to stuff everything and actually drive the order about two and a half hours away and mail it for her because she wanted it to be postmarked in her home city. <laughs> And I was so young and so green at the time that I was like, oh, sure, I can do that. That's no problem. So now I've learned quite a bit. I would not be doing that now. But, um, but yeah, I did it for her and I was happy to do it at the time because I just couldn't believe that I had gotten an order that big. How much time usually takes like an uh, order that's a normal for you? You said like 200, 300 uh, around, mm -hmm. something like this. How much time do you need to execute it and... Uh, is it been uh, cases that uh, clients come a bit uh, late for you to do the things or do they usually give you the proper time to do it? Yeah, yeah. I usually book myself off for about 20 to 25 a day. So an order of 200 or 250 is going to take me a couple of weeks to do, which I feel like is sort of normal. I don't know, maybe I'm super slow. Um, and I d also don't book myself any for Saturday and Sunday. So that way, in case I get behind during the week, I can catch up on the weekends and then come Monday morning, I'm not behind because that's a terrible feeling to start the week in a hole. And um, what, what was the second part of your question? Is, uh, have you had like moments when a client... Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, unfortunately, all the time. Um, Sometimes they're late in two different ways. Sometimes they'll call me or, or, you know, email, DM me, whatever the case may be, and they'll say, I'm getting married or my daughter is getting married in three months. Um, we've, you know, we've got a wedding this summer or whatever. Can you do the, the addressing for me? Which that most of the time is going to be a no. Unfortunately, I have to have a lot of lead time just because I book up so fast. So right now I'm booked up until, I forget, I think it's sometime in August. Um, so it just books up really, really quickly. So that's one way that they are late, which they're technically not late. They just don't really call me in time. But another way that um, clients are late a lot of times is getting their list to me, which is really frustrating <laughs> as a calligrapher. And I'm sure all of the other people out there who address envelopes can feel the pain here. 
you know, I always try to say, I need your list on, you know, Monday morning, April the 1st or whatever the date is. And so technically I need your list a little sooner than that because I want to go ahead and look over it, make sure there aren't any questions. And I want to have it printed out. If you're emailing it to me, I want to have it ready to go. So after I drop off at school, first thing Monday morning, I can come home and start to work right then. And a lot of times they will say, um, say Monday morning rolls around and I've emailed them about it already. And they're like, oh, yes, yes, I'm going to get that to you this afternoon. Well, I'm already 25 in the hole by that afternoon because I should have already had my first 25 done at that point. And, um, or they may say, you know, I, we've run into some snags on our list, which I do get, that happens. Um, but they might say, we've run into some snags on the list. Can I send you the first 50 to get you started? Well, the, and I always say yes, because I need to get started. So that's okay if they do that. But then after I get, you know, ready, with, finished with that 50, they'll send me the whole entire list. So I print out the new list and I have to go through and check off on the new list all the names that I've done from the old list, make sure there aren't any changes, things of that nature. So that's really a frustration <laughs> um, because I do feel like I give everybody, you know, enough lead time. And a lot of times you have already sent out a save the date. So hopefully you already have most of your names and addresses in order. But I don't know, that's the biggest snag that I run into is people will not get me their list, a complete list on time by the date that I need it. But, you know, we're all human and <laughs> everybody, you know, is not punctual. And I just try to be flexible and work with everybody because, I don't know, you know, we, we all deserve grace. <laughs> and um, I just try to be, be as flexible as I can and work with people. Awesome. Uh I don't know if you want to answer the next question, but like, I guess it, it might be helpful for some people. Can you tell me what's your, what's your price, how much you charge at the moment? And if there are people who are willing to focus on doing such, ta such things as you, how would they decide what their price should be? If you can give any advice yes. on this. Yes. So I don't charge 50 cents an envelope anymore. I am, if it's a double set, which is an outer and inner together, I charge $6.50 each. Um, if it's a single envelope, I charge $5 each. Some people will charge by the line and they'll say, you know, if you have an apartment number and that's a separate line, they charge you for it. Um, and it's really broken down line by line. I don't do that just because that's more work for me. And there's not enough of a difference, in my opinion, to separate it out that intricately. I just like to charge per set. So I'm at $650. I do feel like that even if you're a beginner and this is your very first uh, order that you've ever done, I don't feel like you should do it for less than three each. I just feel like your time is more valuable than that. And if you know your stuff well enough to be able to do a wedding envelope order, then you've had many, many hours of practice and time spent getting to this point. And so even if this is your first order, you've put in a lot of hours and a lot of work to be able to get there. And that is worth money. Um, honestly, I probably would not even go that low, maybe 350 or four, um, depending on the market that you live in. And I know some smaller markets, you know, have to charge a little bit less than the larger markets. And I get that. But, um, and I feel like too, that if people have gone to the trouble and expense to want you and to seek you out, then they're willing to pay what you're asking to be paid. I feel like they, they don't mind. I, I've never, I'm trying to think. I don't think I've ever had anyone to say, um, you know, I love your work, but I'm so sorry you're too high. I've just never had anyone to say that. Either they want me or, and, you know, I've got time to do it or they don't. Um, you know, I have had a few people to say, we love your work. It just doesn't fit in our budget right now. 
You know, we're over budget already, and I totally get that. That is completely fine. But as far as me overpricing myself, I just don't think that's the case. And I had a great friend to tell me one time, too, just a little tip for people out there. I don't know if you follow Angela Welch on it. Instagram. She is amazing. She's wonderful with the pointed pen and the paintbrush. She can do it all. But she says if you're ever in a slump and you need to uh, try to drum up a little bit of business, she says to go up in your prices. And when I first heard that, I thought that's crazy. There's no way that can make sense. But um, it really does make sense because for me, like if I walk into a clothing store and I see a shirt that's $50 and then one right beside it that's $100, I'm going to want the one that's $100 because for whatever reason, I feel like that shirt has got to be better because it costs more. It's got to be better quality. You know, I am drawn to the more expensive one. And I think it's sort of the same principle. If you're so cheap, people are not going to think you're that good. They're going to equate the quality of your work with your price. And um, so, yeah, so she says, if you need to drum up some business, go up in, in your price. So I thought that was a great tip of a of, uh, bit of advice. And um, so I, I haven't used that myself, but if I ever get in a lull, I definitely will. No, but, but I really like this. Like, it makes sense and it's, it's amazing. I think that's a really great tip, actually. I never yeah. thought, thought about it this way, but now that you explain it, it makes so much sense. It's like it, it makes so much sense. It really does. And I really do think people, when they see a super cheap price, um, they're going to assume that the quality is just as cheap. And that is the last thing that you want, for sure. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you're, you're teaching workshops. Can you tell me like how long have you been teaching workshops and uh, what are you teaching in those workshops and where, where are the places that you are doing them? Yes, yes, yes. Um, first of all, I love teaching. It is awesome. I have met some of the nicest, kindest people through teaching that I have ever met. One of my very best friends I met through teaching. She came to one of my workshops and Now she's just one of the most dearest friends to me. And um, yeah, and, and people are always so kind and gracious um, in the workshops. But I have taught, um, I taught at Iampeth last year. I'm teaching there again this summer. I've taught at the International a couple of summers ago when it was in Ogden, Utah. And I hold workshops just sort of around my area within like a two hour range. Um, And I host those myself. I've also taught at Paper and Ink Arts a few times in Nashville, Tennessee. And um, other than that, I mainly teach at guilds around the country. So the calligraphy guilds just get in contact with me to come teach at their, you know, one of their meetings. And um, so a calligraphy guild is, is really just a calligraphy club. And you have monthly meetings and you have letter exchanges, and they'll get different calligraphers and artists to come in and teach workshops that you can go to. Um, and so I've taught, gosh, I can't even remember how many, set, uh, all across the country at different guilds. Um, I just got through going to Tulsa, Oklahoma. I went to Atlanta in February. I taught at Paper and Ink Arts in January. Um, in April, I'm going to host um, one of my own. I'm also going to um, a cute little farm that I like to teach at in February. I mean, in, in April. Um, and then I'm going to New York in June, Denver in July, and hopefully Miami in August. That one's not set in stone yet, but I hope that that pans out because I would love to go to Miami. But um, the things that I normally teach Are I do a beginning copper plate class. That one takes you just from square one all the way to learning the correct letter forms for the lowercase and the uppercase letters. And that's a one-day class. All of mine really are one-day classes unless they request a two-day class and then I make it longer with like a project or something. 
So that's a one day class. And then I also do a modern scripts variation class. Um, so taking the copper plate and just sort of making it a little more fun and less formal. So I teach two or three different variations of that. And I will say something on the modern note. I, I think modern definitely has a place and a time for things nowadays. Um, I do love to see copper plate, uh, modern script that is rooted deeply in copper plate. I think you still need to know your letter forms. Um, I don't think it's a free for all. And I think less is more with the modern. I think if you bounce your baseline just a little bit, bounce your X height just a little bit, not much, throw in a few little flourishes, I think that's all you need. I don't like to see modern script that's way too far out there. Now, that's just me personally, just because I think it's too hard to read. But I do teach the modern class. Um, and then I also teach a flourishing class, which is one of my very favorites to teach. That class takes you um, through all of the different variations. I say all of the different vari variations, not all of them, because there are thousands upon thousands, but several different variations that you can do that are flourishes off of the letters. I feel like flourishing can is sort of divided into three groups. I feel like there's the group that flourishes off the letters, and then I feel like there's sort of a group that flourishes around the words, sort of like Ann Elzer does. She is insanely talented at that. And then I feel like there is a group that is nothing but flourishes, standalone flourishes. And when I say that, I always think of Heather Held. Like she will do these beautiful borders or flourishes that make up shapes, but that are nothing but flourishes. So I mainly do the types of flourishes that are coming off the letters. And that's what I teach in my flourishing class. And we learn how to make um, the ovals the correct way. We learned definitely how to critique our work, which I think is so very important because if you can't see it, then you can't fix it. And if you can't see it, then you just think it looks great. And that is very important for you to think that it looks great. But you do want it to be technically sound and technically correct. And um, so I always stress the shapes of the ovals and how to come up with the proper shape. That class is really sort of like flourishing theory, which I hate to name it flourishing theory because that makes me think of piano theory, which is really boring to me. <laughs> and this class is absolutely nothing but boring. It is so fun. And I see a lot of people that have light bulb moments and things click after this class. And the main thing that I hear people telling me after this flourishing class is that it makes them look at flourishing in a way that they've never looked at it before. And I can definitely say that it's the same for me. Once I started teaching this flourishing class, I look at flourishes completely different than I did before. And it's sort of hard to describe that without you know, you being able to see how I teach it. But, um, so I teach that class. And then I also have an envelopes and etiquette class, which is a new class that I added about a year ago, maybe a little less than a year ago. And it's so much fun. So we take everything that you can think of about addressing envelopes, all the rules, all the do's and don'ts, you know, if you have a particular situation with this couple, they live together, but they're not married. How do you address that? Things of that nature. So in the morning time, we learn all about the etiquette and the rules that you need to apply to each envelope. And then the afternoon portion is spent addressing the envelopes. And we'll come up with different scenarios and figure out how to address those. And it's a super, super fun class. And people... I always encourage people to share their nightmare stories just so it can save the rest of us from repeating that nightmare. Like I had one lady to tell us one time that she accidentally addressed all of the outside envelopes as the inner ones and all the inside envelopes as the outer ones. Horrible, horrible, horrible. She had to redo the whole entire order. So, But I am so grateful that she shared that with us 
Um, and the reason that she did that was because normally if one of the envelopes is going to be lined, it's usually the inside envelope that's lined. And for whatever reason, these outside envelopes were lined. And so she accidentally flip-flopped them. So in the envelopes and etiquette class, people share stories like that. And I think I learn as much as everybody else learns. And we just all share tips and tricks that we've come across and have learned throughout the years. And so I'll add that to my list and, you know, include it the next time I teach. So it's, it's a huge learning class for me as well. But it's super, super fun. And a lot of times the guilds and like places like paper and ink arts will have me to come teach on a Saturday and Sunday. And I'll do flourishing on one day and then the envelopes and etiquette on the next day. And those two sort of go hand in hand because they're both intermediate classes. So, but yes, I enjoy teaching so much. It is just so much fun and it's fun to see those light bulb moments and when people get it and they're like, ah, oh, I never thought about that. And it's just such a joy and to make new friends and, you know, see new places and things of that nature. It's just really, really good. Do you have uh, such, a, such a nightmare story, as you call it, of yourself? Something that you've done very wrong or something like this? My gosh, yes, I do. Unfortunately, and it happened to me not long ago, and I'm still sort of shaken up about it. <laughs> I did an order last September for a company who shall remain nameless. They were really, they were really nice about it, though. I did an order for them, and um, I don't want to say the kind of ink I used because I don't want to give that company a bad name because they are a super, super great company. But I, they, they requested navy ink, and so I used my go-to navy. And um, this particular order had an outside and an inside envelope. The inside envelope had a wax seal. Not the outside one, but the inside one. So, when I stacked the order together and shipped it back to them, in transit, the envelopes, you know, sort of jiggle and rub together just a little bit, just in movement. And the spot where that wax seal was pressed against the envelope and the ink transferred to the back of the next envelope to it, next to it. And not all of the envelopes did that, but a lot of them did. I, she, the lady never told me exactly what percentage of the envelopes were messed up, but I, all of the, uh, of the extra envelopes that I had left over at the end of the order, I redid those. So she picked out which ones were, were the worst ones. I redid those, mailed them back to her immediately, apologized profusely, and I told her, I said, I have been doing this 26 years and I've never, ever, ever once had this ink to do this. And it's waterproof, it's light fast, you can literally run it under running water and it won't budge. So, but I have found out that obviously it can be not smear proof. And so anyway, that was a nightmare story of mine. And so now I, right after that, I ordered a thousand sheets of tissue paper. And so now if I ever have to use that ink again, I put a, a tissue piece of tissue paper in between each envelope. They were very, very nice about it. And um, we did repair most all of them. And also I told um, her to go get a sand eraser, a mono sand eraser. And that is made by Tombow and you can go in and sort of erase those smear marks off. So she did be, was able to repair most of them and what she couldn't, I had to redo. So it was salvaged, but there were many tears shed by me <laughs> after she emailed me that and told me what had happened. I couldn't believe it. So live and learn can you share the name of the ink i mean i know you don't want like to put a bad name for the brand but first i think people would be good to know and second maybe if somebody from the brand listening can uh, know that they have to do something about it i don't think it uh -huh. will be a bad name it's just people to have 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I did talk to them. Um, so the the ink is um, Ziller ink, which is one of my favorite inks to use. I love it. I can't say enough great things about it. Um, and I did talk to them and they were wondering if it was just the paper that I was writing on. I even added gum Arabic to it to try to get it to bond with the paper more. And like I said, I didn't realize this until after the fact when I was emailed by the company. But, um, but I, I do love Ziller Ink. I can't say enough great things about it. Um, you know, it's waterproof. It's light fast. Um, and I will have to say I've only had that problem with the navy. I don't know if all the colors do that, but I've never, ever once had a problem with any of the other colors except for the navy. And I've never had a problem with the navy other than that one order. And I do think that the the wax seal on the inside of that envelope rubbing against it made a difference because that was a hard surface that was rubbing against it while it was moving, you know, in shipment. And so I think that definitely had a, a large thing to do with it. I think that had a lot to do with it. So I don't know. I've never had trouble with it since and I've used it since, but, um, I think it was a combination of the ink, the paper, and that wax seal. I think it was just the trifecta of bad news for me anyway, but. Do you enjoy more uh, uh, teaching, giving workshops, or you enjoy more uh, doing client works and just uh, practicing calligraphy? Oh man, that's a tough question. That's asking like, who's my favorite child? Um, I think when I'm addressing envelopes, that's my favorite thing. I get in a rhythm, I can sort of zone out. It's very therapeutic. And um, it's very relaxing for me. But then when I teach, I think that's my favorite. I love sharing what little bit I know. And um, I just love spreading the word. And I love seeing those moments where people just get it and it clicks with them. I love that. So, I don't know. I think I like them both equally, honestly, but just in totally different ways. Teaching is the most exhausting thing I do and the most exhilarating thing that I do at the same time. It's just equally both of those. Um, but then when I give an envelope order back to a bride and she calls me, you know, and is just on cloud nine because she thinks it looks so beautiful, that is so rewarding and I know that all of her dearest people are about to see that. And that just makes you feel so good. And a lot of times the brides will, you know, say, I, I, I put my envelopes in the mail or put my invitations in the mail last week. And I've gotten so many phone calls about how beautiful they are. And I just can't thank you enough. And they're so grateful. And it's just, it, it's the best feeling. So... I don't know. I really do think I love them both. They're totally different from one another, but I just love them both the same, but just for different reasons. You just love what you do. Yeah, I really do. I really do. Yeah, I can be mad at the world, and if I can sit down and write for 30 minutes, I think my blood pressure just lowers, and I can just take a deep breath and exhale, and I don't know. All is right with the world if I've got a pen in my hand or if I'm talking about it. Awesome, awesome. Well, I have many more questions which I want to ask and it's super awesome to listen to you, but I know you have to go in not so long. So I will ask two, three more questions and then okay. I want you to promise me that we do another podcast in the future. I don't know, in some months or anything like this. Sure, when, when sure. We can go Absolutely. Longer. Yes, I'm happy to. Absolutely. Well, what other than calligraphy, like... Is there anything else that you enjoy doing when you have time? For example, I've seen you many times. You do, you go to tennis. I don't know if it's you or just your daughters playing it, but are there things that you enjoy doing uh, other than calligraphy? Yes, yes, yes. Well, I used to be an avid tennis player. I was obsessed with it. I played probably five or six days a week. And then I had my younger daughter, who's 15 now. 
And so now I just, I don't know, I don't have time anymore. And I just live through her. She's the tennis player of the family. Um, so it's her busy tennis season right now. So we had, I say we, I feel like I'm out there with her as well. She had a match uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this week. And she'll have another one, I think, Monday and Tuesday of next week. But even when she's not playing matches, she's, you know, practicing two or three hours every day. So, I don't know. I just live through her. So, I'm usually at the tennis court with her or I'm doing something with my dogs. I've got two golden retrievers. Uh, Mabel is five. And we just got the new one, which we named Dixie, for Christmas. And so, she is about four months old. So, she keeps me busy for sure. I forgot how having a new puppy is just like having a new baby in the house. <laughs> I feel like I am constantly taking her out to go potty or filling her food bowl and the water bowl. That's all I do, that, and then I'll sit down and write a few more envelopes. So I have them outside right now, but they're sitting patiently looking at me through the window, wondering when I'm going to let them back in. Um, so I do that. We take them on walks at night. And so during the fall... We are huge football fans, and uh, we, we are huge Alabama football fans on top of that. That's where I went to college. That's where my husband went. We met there, and then my older daughter is in college there now. And so we go to all of the home football games, and that's just a fun family weekend for us. And um, so between football and tennis and my dogs, that probably gets most of my free time. In the summertime, we love to spend all of our hours as much as possible on the lake. We've got a little place. Um, the Tennessee River runs through Florence, which is where I live. And we have a lake house that we go to. And um, so we like to spend our, our summer days out there. So just your average boring life <laughs> and I wouldn't trade it for the world I like being boring <laughs> awesome awesome I don't think it's boring well uh I know you have like a plenty of super awesome uh pen holders can you tell me which are your favorite top three pen holders that you use the oh, most oh man that is a loaded question okay I don't even know if I can narrow it down to three but I can tell you my favorites and why they're my favorites. Um, I love, absolutely love Brian Smith from Unique Obliques. He made my very first pen. He is such a dear. Um, his customer service is, it is absolutely incredible. And um, the quality of his pens are over the top, you know, top of the line. I absolutely love my pens also from Christopher Yoke. Um, I have two of his pens, and for whatever reason, I'm sure it's the wood that they're made out of, but those are a little bit lighter than the other pens that I own, and they feel great in my hand. Um, his customer service and talent are absolutely second to none. He's incredible, so I love his pens. I also have a pen from Ed Curran that is so super. It's called his E-Curve pen. It's flat on the top. It's not rounded on the top. And it feels really good for your index finger to rest right there on that little spot in the pen. So I love that one. Um, let me think here just a moment. Um, the pens that I use the most are going to be pens from Lindsay Hook. I have four of her pens, and she made one for me in the very beginning, fitted for a Nico G. And I liked it so well, I emailed her back, and I said, I want two more pens. I want one fitted for the Hunt 22 and one for a Jalop 404. So she made those. So I had three there for a while, and I emailed her I don't know, maybe six or eight months ago, and I said, I would like another one. <laughs> I cannot get enough of your pens. And this one is fitted for the Hunt 101. I probably use hers more than anyone else's. Not that I don't love everyone else's, because I do. They're absolutely incredible. I've got about 25 different pens from probably maybe about 13 different pen artisans. Um, hers just feel really, really good in my hand. They're a little bit 
fatter around the foot of the pen. They're not quite so skinny. And um, I feel like that helps me not to have a death grip on the pen. And it also helps when I write for a long, long time for my hand to not get so tired. And um, hers are custom made to my hand. She had me to send in a couple of different measurements. I think I may have even also sent in a picture of how I hold the pen. I can't remember now. So she made the pen custom to my grip and my measurements. And so they feel like I have on a glove. I mean, it's just an extension of my hand. They feel so good. They're hand carved and um, just beautiful pens. All of my pens are beautiful. I um, would just die if I ever lost any of them or, or broke any of them. So that would be a sad day. But um, I have one straight holder that is by Heather Held absolutely gorgeous. It's hand painted with the most beautiful blue flowers on it you've ever seen. So her work is phenomenal. Everyone loves Heather. And um, I don't know, I'm going blank right now. I have several from other different um, pen artisans that they're all great. I love them all for, for different reasons. Um, I really do, but probably Lindsay Hook is the one that I use the most of just because I really like the way it feels in my hand. I see. Well, that's awesome, and like this is the first time I hear somebody like making a pen according your measures. Just like uh, mind blowing. I don't know. I don't yeah. know if any other one is doing such things, but that that sounds like insanely awesome. Yeah, I know, I know. And she doesn't do every single pen like that. Um, like she does have uh, pens on her website available for purchase. Um, these were just pens custom that I requested for her to make just for me. So that's why she got the measurements. But you can, I mean, anyone can request, you know, a, a custom pen made only for them. Um, or I think you can just go to her website and order straight off of the website. But yeah, she's very, very talented and a great calligrapher on top of that. Her work is absolutely beautiful. It's beautiful. Awesome. Well... The last thing is, if uh, for the people who are listening, if you want to give them any advice, a tip, if they are thinking to start or if they are doing already some kind of calligraphy or lettering, if you want to share anything, if you want to promote anything for you upcoming, just go on. Okay, okay. Well, as far as promoting anything, I hope to do a series of workshops here in Florence this summer. A Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but I haven't picked the dates yet. We, um, we've got to plan our summer vacation, which we have not done yet. We're notoriously late on planning things. So I've got to get those dates set, but I will let everyone know on Instagram when I do decide on those dates and what they are and exactly what I'm going to teach. I hope, hope to do like a beginning copper plate and then flourishing one day and then envelopes and etiquette one day, those three classes. Um, and as far as any tips and in, in words of encouragement I can give, um, I would say if you're wanting to get into it, absolutely just do it. Just go for it. Take a class, whether it's an online class. Um, David Grimes has a great um, in grocery script class going on right now that's online. Young Hei Chung also has one. She's Logos Calligraphy. And David Grimes is Moss Grimes. They're phenomenal, both of them. And Elzer always has classes going online all the time. There are a lot of people that have online classes. Uh, I, I know I'm probably leaving so many people out. Um, those are just the ones that immediately popped into my head. Um, buy a book. Go to iampeth.com. Join iampeth. They have all kind of lessons there that um, you can learn from. They have old historical um, exemplars that you can look through and study and things of that nature. But I would just say learn as much as you can through lessons. Um, get on Instagram and go to the masters like Jake Weidman, Harvest Crittenden, um, people that are really good like David Grimes. Look and see who they follow. Follow those people because you know those are going to be top of the line people. Um, and I would say just start. It doesn't matter. I don't feel like 
what subject you start in, just start somewhere. Because I really do feel like once the bug gets you and bites you, you're not going to be able to let it go. And hopefully you will meet as many wonderful people as I've met through calligraphy. And there's just no way you could stop learning ever once you start it. Um, so just start somewhere. And I will share this one little tip that a, a dear friend of mine named Melissa Baker shared with me. I tell everybody that I can this anytime I get the opportunity. This is the best tip I have ever found for writing, particularly when you have to use your light pad. So I have a leather blotter from Mike Ward, who is another amazing calligrapher, by the way. He's insanely talented in so many areas. But I use his leather blotter whenever I can put my paper straight onto the blotter. But a lot of times, my work is done over a light pad because I'm doing envelope work and I, I slip a guideline in each envelope so I can see my straight lines and my slant lines. And so, my friend Melissa Baker told me one time, if you put a piece of white felt over your light pad, it acts as a blotter like the leather blotter does, but you can still somehow see straight through it. It doesn't block out the light and you can still see your guidelines through the felt. I get them at my local craft store. They're already cut for me in a nine by 12 size and they come in two different thicknesses that I have found anyway, a one millimeter and a two millimeter. And I get the two millimeter, which is a little bit more thick and stiff and I can see my guidelines straight through to that. It doesn't block out any light and it acts as a cushion and it feels so great. So you're not writing directly on that glass surface of your light pad, you're writing on the piece of felt and it's got a little bit of give to it and it feels so much better. So that's my, my main tip of the day. <laughs> awesome, I think this is a great ending. Well, thanks a lot Susie for being in the Calligraphers podcast. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Yeah. And, you um, are welcome. Thank you for having me. It was it was a pleasure. This is a likewise, and I'm looking forward for our next time when we have more time to speak about because it was awesome. Awesome, awesome. Sounds great. Thank you so much. So that's it for today, guys. Thank you for listening to another episode of Calligraphy Master Show. I really hope you enjoyed listening to the story of Susan Cunningham, and it helped or inspired you in some way. Next Sunday, I'll be speaking with. Victor Pushkarev about Cyrillic calligraphy and his journey. Please follow Calligraphy Masters on Instagram, Facebook and YouTube. And as always, keep writing.